I want to talk about today about something that I chose to do, which is falling back in style. Um, I've been in this job for a long, long time. Uh, 25 years a web developer. I worked for Yahoo. I worked for Mozilla. I worked on two browsers. I worked on uh, Visual Studio Code. I helped uh, the GitHub Copilot get off the ground, and all these bits and bobs. And uh, it's been working in different countries. Lived for 16 years in London. Worked in America in the Silicon Valley. Hated every moment of it. Uh, went back to Germany now, where I'm just confused. And in general, I'm just saying there is a great market there. But I also see that we are uh, it, in, at another crossroads. In 2000, there was the big dot-com crash. And I remember when that happened, and I wasn't working at dot-com. And then I moved to England, and I started working on local government stuff. Because you don't have to do any work for the first three years, because they don't expect you to do anything useful. And then you basically could wait that out until the market caught up again. And I see the same thing right now. There's like mass layoffs everywhere. Everybody is basically considering like we don't need developers at all anymore. So, um, and the bigger thing was then when I just got, uh, I was on the wrong spreadsheet at Microsoft. So I was one of the 11,000 people that got laid off. And uh, when I then went back to the job market with 25 years of experience and people like, Oh, okay, cool. So you've been eight years at a company. That means your your information is kind of stale. And you're like, I was at the company whose products you're using, but okay. And there was an ageism thing going on as well. Like, so are you really, why don't you have your own company yet? Which sounds a bit like my, my mom talking to me. <laughs> so it was just weird. So seeing a lot of that come and go and being in the first dot-com crash and stuff made me allergic to Hyperbole. I just basically, I hate all these social media things and I, uh, after now Twitter became like a, a dumpster fire, I think is the best word. Uh, um, I, I looked at LinkedIn again and oh my God, it's even worse. It's just hilarious how many people just generate random bollocks every day. And I love to comment on these things. Like, I love this, like the typical open AI engineer makes $925,000 a year. And I just said typical and people didn't like that. It was like lots of things coming back, like, hey, you don't have to destroy it. And I'm like, hey, you don't have to talk bullshit, because nobody gets that. Um, this coffee shop uses AI to track the productivity of baristas and how much time customers have spending in the shop. Orwell likes this. <laughs> or Netflix offers up to $900,000 for AI product manager. You must start learning AI now. You must do fuck all. I'm so tired of this language which almost got me banned from LinkedIn again, so, okay. <laughs> but size isn't everything. I'm so tired of this inflation thing when people say like, oh, you gotta have $100,000 to start with as a 16-year-old engineer who just did something in their free time or you're not gonna be a success. In fact, I think incredibly fast growth and inflated salaries are red flags. Companies paying you a lot of money Weirdly enough, expect a lot of you as well. It's what most people don't understand. And uh, huge growth is something that keeps growing and falling. ChatGPT may be the fastest growing consumer app in history, reaching 100 million users in the first two months, blah, blah, blah. And then, of course, there was like Meta's Twitter rival threads searches 100 million users faster than ChatGPT. Why does everything have to have 100 million users on the first day? There's not that many people on the planet that have enough time to use another app for 100 million users. And of course, I mean, Threads had a great idea because Twitter, as said, was basically just a real dumpster fire. But a, day, a few days later, the account fell down again and, uh, and had a real problem with it. And they're still struggling to retain new users. And I guess the problem is that signups aren't users. But we love that in our headlines, like, oh, I got so many users. And especially automated signups and conversions, like, oh, you use, LinkedIn, you use Instagram, you're now also a Threads user, if you're in America. Because that was the other problem, a US-only rollout, or why, company, uh, why, why comply with privacy laws, you can just do it in America, right? Makes no sense. And if I, as a European, see that the thing is not available to me because they don't want to comply with privacy, probably as an American who likes privacy will not be using that thing either. And there was nothing new on offer except fewer racists, or I think that's what they started with. And I'm worried and bored about big tech solutions. I hate that all, all that comes from these companies is this next big thing. Oh, we want to be the new chat GPT with 100 million users. We want to be that with the 200 million users. We want to be the super app. If you want to get really frustrated, look for super apps. 
Because uh, WeChat in China is basically used for bloody everything. And the reason is that the internet is censored and you cannot use the internet. That's why everybody uses the WeChat app. But everybody wants to be the WeChat app. Everybody wants to own the user and have them only use their product. And that's something that I fundamentally disagree with because the end user should be in control what things they want to use. If they don't like my product and the competitors is better, great. Be happy. I just talked to two people that wanted to start a new job. I work for a company right now that's a huge job board. I told them about my company and our biggest competitor because they're actually pretty cool as well. You have choice. Please give us choice. So releasing a great product needs time. It needs user research. We actually need to find out if the users are actually out there and not like, oh, we like this product. It's probably going to be cool for everybody. It's, need, it's finding unmet needs. Most of the time you don't know what your users want and they don't know either. You have to ask the right questions during interviews to see what they really want to have. Like nobody wants to have a solution. Everybody wants to have something that solves a problem for them. They aren't interested in how your product works. They want to have something that makes their life easier. You have to check the technical feasibility, you choose a platform, legal compliance needs. That was fun in Microsoft for the last eight years. I was always the person that looked at GDPR and all these things. And it's great when you get asked to actually say, hey, how was our growth over month over month? And I'm like, well, I got to discard the data every 28 days, so I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's really fascinating. Measuring the success without being creepy, without actually me measuring everything that people do is another big problem. I think what a lot of people don't understand is that people don't buy products, that they buy solutions to their problems. And I love this one. I mean, you want to try the thing out, right? <laughs> and that's an important thing to remember, that like people use your product in ways that you haven't thought of, and actually you might want to think about as well and see if you can unearth a new market that way. The web is to me still the killer and greatest product ever. I was a radio journalist as my job. I was newscaster at a radio station in a small German town, bored to tears, got like faxes from the police in the morning and had like 50 minutes to turn file sheets into three sentences that make sense for somebody who's ironing or looking after their children while they're listening on the radio. Which taught me about writing on the web as well because everybody scans, nobody reads your stuff online. And then I was doing computer stuff on the side. I wrote games for Commodore 64 and these kind of things and Amiga. And then I realized, hey, I can put these things together because there's the web. And the web to me is still the killer product that we have. Everybody can contribute and become a publisher. Right now, when ChatGPT just announced their new, uh, their new way to actually build your own GPT clients, I was like, oh, everybody can become a solopreneur now. You don't need to be a developer anymore. Don't need a developer to start a product. You can build a bloody website by going to GitHub Pages or WordPress or something. You become a publisher immediately. You don't need to be a developer for that. You work, you work can link to others. Your, your stuff validates the quality by linking to other blogs, by linking to other resources, by linking to your competitors. And for 25 years, I had to explain to customers that that's not a bad thing. That actually it shows how confident you are in your own product if you talk about other people's products and not just like go to the app store and download ours and please stay in that one until you die. People can see what you publish 24-7, you meet people from all over the world, and human knowledge and creativity is archived, at times accidentally. That's where archive.org comes in, and websites that I shut down 20 years ago is still available there. Especially in the gaming industry, like as I said before, in 8-bit systems, those, those games were made on floppy disks and tapes. There was no backup, and most of those are not readable any longer. The pirated versions were actually uploaded to FTPs, to news groups, and, and then later on to uh, P2P, and these are still available. So a lot of people that I know that were programmers in the 80s still can play their games, although they don't have a copy of the originals anymore at all. So piracy is a good way to actually archive things. Tell that to the police when they catch you. I think we did good in the past. We, we, the, the web came around and the web became unruly. Like, oh, how do I find stuff? Bookmarks didn't work, like uh, uh, link lists didn't work, link rings, to, like blog rings and these kind of things didn't work. So we built products that actually were proper products for the web. Web search to find things like um, AltaVista, Lycos, WebDE, 
Fireball, Hotbot, and then it, I worked for Yahoo, uh, worked on that search engine, which then became uh, Microsoft Bing, which was annoying because my own code came back to me 10 years later in another company, and I'm like, it was shit back then, I don't want to look at it again. Um, email tools to communicate. Gmail, as much as we hate it now because there's so much ads in there, is actually was a, a, a revelation that actually made email so much easier to find and actually email becoming an archival thing rather than just a communication thing. Calendars, online, uh, online office to collaborate, like writing things together in, in a Word doc or in a, a Google doc is wonderful. CRM systems to track communication, payment systems and banking, and of course video chat systems for remote work. All of our life can be done on the internet. All you need is internet access. And uh, I'm going to come back to that in a second, but it's actually interesting that this is a thing that kids don't realize anymore. Like, basically, offline is not a thing. We had, like, our modems. And, Mom, don't, please don't pick up the phone or I'm going to be offline. These kind of things. That We don't have that anymore, so that's not an issue any longer. But it's interesting uh, that... It needs only that. So I was wondering if it's actually not a thing, and that's basically the leftist, communist, wonder, wonder, wonder person in me. In Sweden, for example, internet access is a, is a government right. It's a citizen right, and I think that should be anywhere in the world. If our governments want us to do things online, and they should, then they actually should give us access as well, rather than just only having a few people that can go online. But there's the problem that there's a demand for constant growth. Just building apps for the web or building solutions for the web was not enough. We needed to have something cool. So let's talk about from the trenches. Uh, that was back when I lived in England here and I worked on Yahoo Answers. And Yahoo Answers was kind of groundbreaking because the algorithmic search was rubbish. We couldn't find any things. People were looking for things and they couldn't get any good answers, much like now where basically now Google is like five pages of ads and then there's the first thing that's interesting. There was a sweet spot, people answering other people's questions in human fashion. Does this sound familiar? This is what ChatGPT does right now, you know? Like, but back then we wanted to make it human to human and basically create a community around people answering questions. It was a huge success in Korea. That's what a lot of people don't know. Like it actually came from Korea and it was sent to us and then the UOS rollout was a big success for distributed development because the source code was in Korean with Korean variable names and Korean comments. Not many comments, but some. Nowadays, you could do translation inside VS Code. Back then, of course, pipe dream, impossible. So we looked at it and we're like, can't maintain that, no idea. So let's rewrite it. And I had a team in India, I had a team in the UK and a team in the US. So basically, we had 24-hour coverage. Instead of seven months that we planned, we rolled it out in three months. And it proved to people that can, people can work from home and work in different locations, and we can actually do something cool with that. At an excellent API, uh, there was a thing. We built API first, and then we built the interface on top. And we had these internal hack days where in Yahoo Messenger, I allowed you to get answers from Yahoo Answers. Realize something? In a chat system, you can get search results from it. That was 2006. Why am I not a millionaire? This is really annoying. <laughs> That's what it looked like. It was green. Um, I love that. Why does nobody answer my questions and no answers yet? <laughs> but the problem was that actually Yahoo had this really dusty and boring image. It was not Google. It was not the cool search engine. It was like what my mom uses to get like... Um, I don't know, variety news and what other people go look up their football results or what the weather outside is. And it was basically like a, not a cool thing to have. Quora came out, did exactly the same thing, looked a bit fresher, came from New York, so that's obviously a cool thing. So basically that one was the thing that, that people went for. Other players like forums were also ramping up. I think my favorite was the aptly named Experts Exchange. <laughs> really bad. And the solution was to get more growth, stop quality moderation. Like basically we said like, okay, so cool, there's a lot of things in there. And uh, uh, the, the, including the classic, the community will moderate itself. So we need more growth, basically turn off, let the floods come in, let, let, anybody, let anybody publish anything, and the community will flag up things that are really annoying and are really bad. A lot of companies will do that, they will start a community product and say like, we will find moderators because people love us. And you're like, yeah. That's like things like, you know, the free market will control this or wealth will trickle down. So it's kind of the same uh, logic. 
And the thing is then, <laughs> because we opened the floodgate, we made meme history. How is Bobby formed? How is Bobby formed? How girl get pregnant? And the answer was just like, it's, it's words. Some of them are words, not all of them. And it was just incredible. And that made the rounds. And then basically we were kind of dead in the water. And a few years they shut it down. So I got many of these tales. Firefox OS has similar things. Like there were a lot of things where basically like, we need to grow fast, we need to grow quick, and let's get rid of the quality and basically make sure that people love us. And we need to show our, not even our technical folk, we need to know, show our investors that we're constantly growing. So over the last few years, our goals even shifted. We're not caring about building products for people. We actually uh, create products that don't solve problems, we create products to drive consumption. Facebook was the big thing that everybody just wanted to get uh, got jealous of. Like, oh my God, everybody goes to Facebook, stays in Facebook. We have to build an app so people can go in there and stay in there, so we can keep shoving things in their faces and making people buy things. It's sad when you actually realize it by yourself, the amount of clothing that I have that I bought on Instagram because it was actually good, doing good things that actually looked quite good. Most of it is rubbish. I mean, Kickstarter I gave up on. It's just amazing how many Kickstarter things I, I bought drunk that come three years later that are not connecting to the phone anymore that I don't have anymore. It's because it takes ages to roll these things out. But it's nothing new. There's these social media addiction machines. There's a Skinner box, which is a test uh, with rats, where they have a button, and when they press it, a pellet comes out. And when th that happens every single time, then the rat gets bored. And it's like, OK, I, there's pellet coming when I do that. If you don't bring a pellet from time to time, or you bring two at a time, or you make it more random, then the rat will keep pressing that button and actually waiting for more. And this is what all these social media machines are, what Twitter is, what Instagram is, what Facebook is. Basically, keep it going, keep it going. There's also where they have electric shocks. We are not there yet, but that will might come as well. <laughs> The biggest measure that we have, and that as a product manager in Microsoft I had to do as well, is time spent in product. How long are people using your product for? That's the only thing the, the money people look at at the moment. How much ads can we show them? How much can we push into their faces? I built a Visual Studio Code extension uh, where the developer tools of the browser were inside Visual Studio Code. So you didn't have to leave the, the, uh, the editor to actually do proper browser debugging. Uh, 2.1 million downloads, 60,000 concurrent users a day, daily active users, DAOs. And uh, yeah, okay, compared to Edge, like, no, we don't invest in this, it makes no sense. This was 60,000 developers that were using my thing, not 60,000 people watching Netflix or doing something else in the browser. They were actively interacting with the product that I did, but the number wasn't high enough, so basically, no, that's not a product that we're gonna pursue further and do something with. Open source it, put it on the farm with all the other open source products, somebody will, will take care of them. And that, that's the big issue there. Like They looked at like people using the browser, and yeah, people use Netflix for six hours a day, that's great, let's do more Netflix stuff. Let's get people more into these things. And I think this is rampant and utterly wasteful. As a developer uh, product maker, as a tool maker for developers, time in product is useless. I mean, you opening the developer tools of Chromium and actually fixing something and getting out of the developer tools is the happy path that I'm looking for. Not you opening the developer tools and looking at them for eight hours. This is nobody does that. So our job as developer uh, tool makers is to make our job easier to debug things, to fix things, to make it easier to write code. But the biggest wake up call that made me really uh, tainted with big technology was the COVID pandemic. Before the COVID pandemic, all the tech news was about like self-driving cars, Amazon will have drones soon that deliver your stuff, smart contact lenses that detect if you got like diabetes and something, learning bracelets for people with Parkinson's disease that actually don't shake anymore when they do that, and blind people can see with their smartphone. So before COVID, we were all like, tech is here, AI is happening, we're gonna be the solution, your car is gonna be like Kit from, uh, from Knight Rider was called or something. Then during COVID, no idea how to track who has it or not. Like every country that I know spent millions of dollars or euros or rupees or whatever, slotty, 
on like apps that basically were all crap. We had no idea who's got COVID. The tracking didn't work to each other. Germany spent 10 million euros on the thing. It's then uh, basically it didn't do the job. So we had to get another startup to come up with something or write it down on paper. And sadly enough, most actually uh, uh, doctor's offices would send faxes into the government. So they type it into the app back end. So that was the kind of stuff that happened there. Shambolic vaccine roll rollout. We had basically the vaccine quite fast. That was impressive. But rolling it out and getting it into every place was also shambolic as well. And this is what big tech has been telling us for years. We're really good at making things fast for millions of people. And we didn't. We, they couldn't. They didn't care. Uh, social media turned everybody with an opinion into a vaccine expert that knows more about it than scientists do. And many of them are AI experts now. <laughs> or both. Or, I mean, it cracked me up and like the vector vaccine th thing came out and they're like, so Chris, what do you think is better? And I'm like, I think the vector one scales better. It doesn't pixel. <laughs> and people didn't get it, but it was good. <laughs> Working remote was hindered by bad connectivity and lack of devices. Like we've just realized how shit our internet really is when everybody had to work from home and teaching teachers in schools in Germany how to actually talk to their students over Zoom or whatever system they used nothing was ready and nothing was actually planned there. And now, um, during a COVID lull, I think there will be another wave coming, so I'm not, it's not over yet. The expecting tracking software is now defunct. You, you probably all deleted it from your phones. I deleted mine from my phone as well. There's no point to these things any longer. Companies force people to come back to work. It's easier to control them when they're actually in the office, right? Also, the other problem is that most companies rented offices for 10 years at a time. So now they were empty for two years, so they cannot just keep them leaving empty and not allowed to subcontract sub them either. Tech companies fail to cash in or prove themselves as solution providers. And they get rid of thousands of people. Like we had a lot of, I mean, during COVID, people hired like mad because we thought everybody needs tech companies now. And then like, basically after that, we're just like, oh, our share dropped, so sorry about your job. We go back to offering more consumption machines instead of fixing the broken infrastructure. Wouldn't it be now the time to actually look at all the stuff that went through COVID and went wrong? Wouldn't it be now the time to set up every school with a good internet connection and to teach teachers how to actually use the internet and keep the children safe on the internet? But no, we just basically like, oh, Twitter is shit. What's the next thing? Like, can we make, a, can we make one? Every, every company now needs a chat GPT client to give you contact to their 50 entries database instead of these kind of things. Another big thing is that big tech is seen as a great place to work. Everybody dreams of like starting at the Googles, at the Facebooks, at the Amazons, and all these kind of things. It's true, they pay shit lots of money, that's great. Uh, but you actually, if you're lucky, you actually can get to work on really bleeding edge technologies and actually work on products that millions of users are using. If you're not lucky, you also realize that every big company is a lot of small companies inside the company that fight against each other. And you might be in the, on the losing side of these different departments. And the fetish for constant growth is ruining big tech as well. Because as soon as you're on the, mar on the stock market, your job is to keep your investors happy, not your users, not your managers, not your employees. It's about the share price. If the share price drops, it's profitability per head. If you got too many heads, heads must roll, so profitability. None of the companies that laid off thousands of people had money problems. Actually, they are really good money being best dashed back. They just wanted to have the next growth and make sure that that happens. And I think it's leaving the care out of career. It's basically just, we have people here who want to be part of that fast growing thing and run with us. And I think it's not safe for, for doing it. OKRs, KPIs, and these kind of things. Working in big tech means you need to predict and measure everything. There's no such thing as just innovating something and rolling it out. There is one difference. Um, if you ever wondered why Google has so many dead products, if you want your engineer to get promoted in Google, they have to release a product. So a lot of times people had somebody lined up for promotion, they rolled out a product, gave it at Google I.O., gave it a big spiel on stage, and then they basically didn't care about it anymore. So a lot of these really cool things were basically prototypes rolled out as products so somebody can get promoted and the manager can say, my engineer had like two new products out so I can get a promotion as well. OKRs are meant to be aspirational and by design hard to reach. And I never understood this. I'm like, oh yeah, set up the thing that we can be 
we can get closer to it every week and then we basically go there. The problem with OKRs is though they're actually fixed to a half year period. And as I said before, if like in Microsoft you have to be GDPR compliant, you got like four months of research to actually just be able to roll it out. And then you got two months to reach the goal that you might be able to reach. So you're not shipping every day like you do in Agile in any big company out there. You always have to think about what's happening in the next half year. And it feels a lot like Sisyphus. It feels like, okay, we're getting closer, we're getting closer, and then we are, oh, we're not going there. And the problem is then when, uh, when, the, when, when the, the half year is over, new OKRs have to be defined, and you never get the chance to fix the one thing, to finish the one thing that you actually work towards for such a long time. Many of us, I'm 100% sure, I did it twice myself as well, stayed in companies far too long because we basically, we spent five years trying to get this one product out. Next month it's going to happen. The company's finally going to care about it. No, not going to happen. If you it, if it didn't release it in the first two years, you're just wasting your time and everybody else's time as well. And I love the whole fetish of like, you have to get promoted every half year or you're not seen as somebody with a growth mindset. This is how companies are structured. If you get promoted every half year, it should be the other way around because there's not enough jobs up there for people to get promoted to. How is this not obvious that basically you cannot just keep promoting people? So what people do instead is give up on retention and investing in employees. When I lost people in my team, when they had a better offer from somebody else, and I'm like, what can we do to match that? That person is great. He's been here for two years. He's done a good job. No, don't care. If he wants to go, he's going. It's actually seen as in the, the, there's people that game the system that basically say every half year you go to another company and you ask for more money and those to get like lots of money in the end. And you keep, uh, as a lead engineer, I was always like, okay, it takes me about half a year to get somebody up and running to be really effective and then that person leaves again. So again, it felt a lot like Sisyphus because we didn't care about who does the code, somebody does the code, right? And that's just horrible. So my change uh, was from principal tackle program manager to VP. Sounds like, a, <laughs> sounds like a promotion, but this is what's happening right now. So I went from Microsoft to a company called We Are Developers, and I became VP because I got hired as director. And then I said, I'm director of DevRel, but I don't want DevRel to be part of marketing. I want my own department. And they're like, okay, but then you have to promote you to VP. And I'm like, I don't mind. So they promoted me to VP, and now I got my own department. I went from a 221k company to a 75 people employee and I took a 15% pay cut. Question is, am I happy now? No, I'm German, you can't be happy, it's illegal. <laughs> but I am out of that hamster wheel. I don't have OKRs, I don't have KPIs, I don't have to care about the stock price because we don't have any. I can concentrate on, rather than shilling a product or selling a product as a, de uh, as a developer relations person, I'm here for developers. I'm now basically looking at job ads, I'm looking at people's CVs, I'm looking at people laying off and seeing where else we can get hired and these kind of things. And it's really fun to do, it's called We Are Developers, uh, look at it, meh. Nah don't care. Um, but the gaps of big tech is something that I found uh, over the years that I worked in, these, in this industry. And it was just like, tech companies are on a 2020 level of technology, but they sell themselves as 2050. Everybody has AI licked already. And everybody bleeds money with AI right now. They don't know how to monetize it. They have no idea what to do with it. They're actually all... Um, it's no wonder that large corporations, I'm not calling names now, have a company called OpenAI, which is an open company and not them doing it, because everybody is still scared that they can get sued with like generative AI, having all kind of horrible things in them. So make sure your company is not the one that have their name associated with it. Worker rights and job satisfaction feel like factory workers of the 1920s, but we cover it up with money. We throw, people, we throw money at developers and we're still expecting them to not have a normal life and be in the office 24-7. It's great that your company gives you free food and washes your clothes, but it's also a golden cage. It's basically expecting you to be there all day long. And I mean, my dad was a coal miner and a factory worker, so I, I grew up in that whole environment, so I'm like, Jesus, we should do the same thing. And unions are a big thing in America right now, cropping up in the IT market, and I think that's a great thing. When I got laid off, I basically, uh, I got an offer, 
And they say, like, oh, here's some money and here's two months of salary. And I'm like, some money in Germany means 60% tax for the government. And uh, two months of salary, no, a German contract means the, every year I've been in the company, I get one month's salary. So here's the telephone number of my lawyer, talk to him. I'm going to be in the pub. And I think all of us need that. Like, don't sign contracts without anybody looking over it. It's a thing like boilerplate. That's just a, a standard contract. Not a good idea to, to, to sign. Tech does not make us more efficient. It only keeps us more entertained and occupied. That the pandemic thing was so shambolic and it was, was just painful to see that I still have to... Uh, uh, I went to the job in, uh, unemployment office in Germany. Last time I was in there, it was 1994. And I went in and signed up for the website to get like a date to get there. And uh, like, okay, so what's your what's your uh, um, your degree? Don't have any. What's your job? Education didn't finish any. Do you have a driving license? Yeah. Okay, we can work with that. So probably I'd be like a delivery driver or something like that. But I had to go in there just to be in the system. And the system showed like DHTML as one of the skills for computer things in there. So. And uh, the fun thing was that I already had the contract with a new company. I just needed to be unemployed for a month so I can, don't get kicked out of the German NHS system. And uh, the company that they told me where to look for jobs is the company I work for now. <laughs> so, but it's just like faxes and paperwork and everything. Computers are not there when it comes to governments yet. There are many real issues to be fixed using tech, uh, but those are hard and don't have any ad space. And that's basically, you cannot make addictive machines uh, uh, going on there. That's why we don't fix them yet. So maybe it's time to demand more. Demand more real solutions that solve problems rather than feeding the machine with more content. Like if, there's, uh, if pe people ask you to build a new system that's empty, don't. Just don't. We have enough social platforms that are basically dying away right now. Build something better have more choice and more control over our data. That everything is free, nothing is free. Everything free means you pay with your data, you pay with your information. I'm happy to fall behind in style. I'm happy to not be on the bleeding edge of creating another crap app that nobody needs. I'm happy to actually take my knowledge and build things for people with things that they actually need. So don't build the next big thing, build the next small good thing. I mean, look at Dylan with Living Spec. It's a small thing that does one thing well. And it's totally great. He could also go to the Silicon Valley and get like, or sell it to Meta or whatever, but he doesn't want to. He just wants to do one thing well that pissed him off as an engineer, not being able to do these things. Fix one small thing and do it well. And start realizing that your time and data is their currency and demand better. Be actually more stringent about what you give out. Be clearer about where your data goes. And uh, today I'm going to be have, have a few people here who I'm actually working with on a, uh, on a phone that is fully encrypted, gets into a VPN as soon as you start, and has uh, all the Android apps in a sandbox. So you can talk about that later when we meet them outside. But I think it's very important that time and data is something that we should give out for free so people can just show us ads and do something there. So let's listen and record all of the failures of untethered growth. Every time when something is like the coolest news thing, let's record how fast it took for it to fall apart and not be useful anymore. This was a guy in, in, in the 1980s in Poland recording a, 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 a concert. This was pir music piracy in the 1980s. What a legend. I mean, if you do that, you gotta, you gotta know what you're doing. That's quite amazing. And that's all I had, so thanks very much.